You are now listening to the number one podcast. You have been digital interrupted. You are now listening to the number one podcast. You have been digital interrupted. I am digital. I just need everybody that's uh, listening up right now. Can you ping in about five people? Just ping them on in. Welcome on in. It's Digitally Interrupted. This is the first episode that we're actually recording right off of Clubhouse. After this interview with Tanisha Kelly, you guys will have a chance to have a Q&A. You guys will be having the opportunity to talk to her and ask some questions. Ping five people right now, please, if you can. All right, all right. So, welcome to everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome to everybody in the audience. Tanisha, what is going on? What's popping with you? Ain't nothing much out here. You know, just chilling, just chilling. You know, we literally just came out of a room together. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people in the audience, they already know who you are. Um, if you could just give a little introduction of yourself to people who might just be getting hip to you, you know, just reintroduce yourself. Let them know who you are. Of course. Um, my name is Tanisha Kelly, a.k.a. TK. Um, I am famously known for my single, I Wish You Loved Me, that I put out about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, I have had two albums out. Um, I have been signed to three major labels uh, since I was 15. And, yeah, that's about it. My genre is about, is pretty much... Uh, pop R&B or mostly R&B catered. Or dope. So, you know, we know you've had a, uh, I like to call it like a small layoff, a small vacation. Um, you know, let let them know what's been going on in the last, uh, how long have you been out actually? Like how long have you been out of the game? Just kind of just chilling. You haven't been out the game. You've been making music, but how long have you been out the, the spotlight? Well, when I, I'm assuming you're talking about just when I left, um, I left for, I left the industry for about four years. Um, I came back home after uh, situations happened with uh, people that I was doing business with, and I got screwed over in many, many, many ways. And in order for me to get out of those contracts, I came home and had to let music go. I had to act like I, you know, wasn't doing music anymore. So I had to not do music for a while. And I got a little bit complacent, I won't lie. I got complacent back home and um, adjusted to, you know, my prior life to, you know, actually gaining the traction and success that I had gotten. But, um, yeah, I just I came back home and. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, you know, and explain because you have dropped some singles. So if you can, like, let them know some of the records that you have released uh, recently within the last four years that you've been out of the industry. Yeah. So I'm I, that was kind of like my rollout for coming back to the industry, I guess, quote unquote, so to speak. Um, I just wanted to dip my feet in the waters again. And I spoke to so many of my friends that were still in the industry. And I, I you know, I would tell them, like, I've never been fearful of, you know, making music or putting it out. And they just had to remind me it's like riding a bike and you just got to get on that bike and start riding it again. It's easy. You could do this. You got this. And boom, I just I went into the studio, started doing records and I just been putting out singles um, until I get this album finished. So, yeah, I have uh, Sleeping Alone. I have I Got You, Babe, Inhale, Exhale, Forget It All, and the most recent is Writings on the Wall, um, which will be up on all music platforms in the next couple of weeks. Um, just having an issue uploading it for because of the, the numbers in the system. Some of the business bullshit, but... Right, right, right. Be- I get it. Um, you know, now... We all know you for, you know, um, I Wish You Loved Me. That was like one of the biggest singles. Now, a lot of people, there are a lot of artists right now that are in the audience that are listening in. And, you know, we always see the glitz and the glamour side of the business. We always see the final product. We always see what is done after. And we enjoy that. We embrace that. But there is a deeper spectrum to Tanisha Kelly, TK, Nisha, Ty, you know, who, you know, however they address you, there's always a deeper root to that. I want you to kind of explain how you got into the industry and just kind of like, you know, give us a timeline of your story and just tell us what you went through, you know, even before I Wish You Loved Me and then after. Like, explain that for us if you can. 
Okay, so those would be two different stories because the story with the I Wish You Love Me thing is is a whole other story. No doubt. Um, but getting to where I got to basically started out, um, you know, I met some, I met one of the funky bunches and I ended up going from um, his basement singing every day to Florida. He moved me to Florida, took custody of me and moved me to Florida. Was in Florida for a while. Um, I ended up living there for six months by myself at 14 years old because he had a family back home that he had to go back and, you know, kind of take care of. So I was kind of like living, you know, my life alone at 14 years old in another state that's so far away from home with nobody around me. And I went from that to um, the girls group, which, you know, my manager at the time slash guardian came back down and then put me in the girls group. And then we flew out to L.A., and I stayed out in L.A. for about 10 years. Um, then after I, after the girls group, I ended up going solo. So I was I was 16 when I went solo, 16 and a half going on 17 um, when I went solo. And then I ended up doing a production, a production deal with Bo Dozier. I did that for um, or about three or four years. And then I signed to Warner Brothers. Three years, actually. I was on it. And I started now after, you know, what, like, what was that process like for you in your head? Like, you know, you go from being a, a woman who, you know, loves to sing. And then now you see, you know, that you're signing this deal. Like, what was that process in your head? Like, did it, did you, did you know at that time that you belonged here or you were just kind of like starstruck and kind of surprised that the situation that fell in your lap? I didn't know what I was doing. I just know that I wanted to sing. So I just was like, okay, whatever. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, you know, what contracts meant. I, I didn't give a shit about any of that. I just wanted to sing. I, I, I didn't pay attention to anything else around me aside from that. So. And I'm going to, I guess I want to say that artists that are out there, you know, when you say that you didn't care about your contracts or anything, you know, I want to emphasize that sometimes down the line that can end up being your demise. And I'm guessing that, you know, what you have told us already, you can <laughs> agree to that. Um, but we'll get That's there. Like example. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> um, how now? How did um, I wish you loved me at that point? How did that come along? Did you think this record was going to be as big as it was, or did it just kind of blow up and you was just kind of like, "Holy hell!" Like this is what's going on right now. Um, I never knew what it was like to to have a record that had blown up, so I couldn't tell you what I felt that it was going to be. I just knew what the record was. Um. I didn't know the record would ever keep me afloat this long, but I knew it was a timeless record when I heard it. I had I hadn't had my hands in doing anything of, of, with this record besides singing it, you know. But when I heard it, I knew that was that was that record was just that was it. That that was the record that was going to be a forever record. All right, and then, you know, now. How was that life back then as far as like touring, performing, you know, did you enjoy the road? You know, what was it that you loved and hated about being on the road? I absolutely loved being on the road in America. And that's no shade to any other country. It was just I was a fish out of water. Once I got to Japan, I started to do um, promotion out there. Um, I cried the first the first night that I got there, like I cried at the in the restaurant in front of everybody and I couldn't help it. It's because I didn't I didn't know how to take it. I, I just didn't I couldn't believe I'd have to get on a plane for 14 hours to go back to my homeland. Like it it was just a shock for me. Um, but I mean, I in America, are you kidding me? I get to travel the fucking country and go to all these different states and meet these people that actually love my fucking music and love me and are giving me this positive energy and just uplifting me when I'm, I've been alone for so long and, you know, never really had family. I've never had a tribe with me. I've never had any of that. I've always been a lone wolf, you know? So my supporters have always meant everything to me. So traveling the country and being able to meet them, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I could only imagine that though. I mean, you know, did, did it, did you find it that maybe people outside the U.S., did you find more support outside the U.S. than you did inside? It's kind of hard to answer that because it, 
I mean, it's on two different scales. So it's like, I hit the hoods out here. I hit all the hoods. I hit the hoods upside the head out here in America. <laughs> so it's different. Like I hit us. I, I just hit a market out here. I didn't hit America. In Japan, I hit Japan. It, it, it So it's like on a different scale. You feel what I'm saying? Right, right. Because I, I seen that there's like uh, two different versions of like, I guess that right now is the only thing that's up is like the Japanese version of the album. Mm hmm. Because that's 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 how it was released. We went I, I actually left Warner Brothers due to my then manager who co who coerced me to leave. Um, and I didn't know that I was actually signing into a 360 deal with Warner Japan. I thought I was signed directly to Warner Japan, but I wasn't. I was signed to his company. Damn, that's crazy. Uh, you know, Well, I guess that falls right into, you know, explaining the dark side of the industry, because now we just kind of talked about the bright side of it and all the glitz and the glamour. You know, when did you finally realize, like, hey, I got to really learn the business of this shit because it's going haywire right now? When I lost it all. And that's the saddest part. And, you know, to some people... You know, a lot of people say losing, you know, losing all, a lot of people see it in a different perspective. Like, what was your perspective at that time of losing it all? What, what makes an artist a dope artist? Their passion, their their drive, their their love for the music. That's what makes the, an artist lovable. That's what makes them relatable. That's what makes people, you know, drawn to them. That you took you took that for me amongst amongst other things. But that was the most important for me. But. Once that when I lost that, I lost everything. I lost my house because the money that was supposed to be given to me was in the person's hands or in their account, and they were MIA. This was someone who ran my business that I had entrusted, who was power of attorney over my life. So it was fucked up for me. And, and you know, uh, I know we had a conversation, you know, outside the interview about this, um, where you were, you know, saying of how artists need to now like handle you know their money where they need to get it first like if you can explain that to artists that are listening right now like explain to them what they need to do as far as giving them some advice like what is your advice to them of handling their music business not just making the music but handling it business wise well i'll say this not not everybody is a michael jackson or a beyonce where they have their parents looking out for them OK, it's not every day that you get that, you know, and it's not easy to trust people. So my main thing would be don't ever give somebody that much power because you feel over. See, for me, I gave that person that much power because I couldn't handle that much shit going on. And I just only wanted to focus on the music. And that was my biggest mistake. I should have honed in on the business. I should have been more interested in how this is going. Where is this going? Why is this money going to? So I would recommend, I would suggest, I wouldn't say you need to, but it's a, it's a recommendation for me is to make sure you never ever give anybody power of attorney unless this is this is actual attorney that does your contract that you know is a legal person and has a, a great reputation who has a good rapport with people or whatever that would be the only exception other than that don't ever put somebody in that fucking position I, to, I totally agree with you on that one. Definitely. What What is your opinion on new, on a new way that music is being marketed and released nowadays? Like, do you wish that back then that, you know, the Internet was accessible as it is now as far as going viral with the TikTok and Instagram? Like, do you like it now or do you think it's kind of uh, it's overshadowing the real talent that should be uh, going viral for real? Well, you said it. It's overshadowing. It's annoying, to be honest with you. I'm keeping it a buck. I, I don't ever fucking sugarcoat anything, but no, it's annoying, to be honest with you, because it makes everybody feel like they can be a celebrity. Like, there's nothing glorifying about being a fucking celebrity unless you have a talent or a knack, or a knack for something or a niche in something. It's annoying. It's annoying. I mean, of how many comedic videos that you see that are actually truly funny that these people are going to go somewhere. 
let's let's look at the last year. It's been that one girl that that mixed girl with the curl. She's really pretty. She was on um, Vine first, but she she's like she like makes some Jim Carrey faces or whatever. She's like the only one of all those people that made those TikToks, those vines to be funny, that made it to the fucking big screen. So it's like it truly oversaturated, and it definitely makes it much harder for people to have to sift out the people who are. Oh, I just want to be a want to say I'm a singer. I just want to say I'm an artist. I want to say I'm a celebrity. Like it's cool to be a celebrity in people's eyes to so much to so much to the point that it's being praised. It's like. I won't ever be like, you could still be as proud of yourself for being a fucking doctor, a brain surgeon. You feel what I'm saying? Definitely. Like you could still be just as proud of yourself for being something like that. Who the gives a fuck about being a celebrity that much to oversaturate and literally flood like news feeds with bullshit? It's crazy. No, I definitely agree with that. I, I definitely agree with that. Is there anybody that you like like at the moment like if you can keep it at three if you have three artists that are like brand new that you kind of like right now yeah um i fucks with um la portia renee i think is i think that's her name la portia renee she's fucking insane she's definitely a church singer kiana lede um i'm heavy on her mm -hmm. um let me think. So I don't want to say nobody who's already got that, you know, that leverage. But yeah, La Portia Renee is her name. Um, and also, I've been listening to um, a lot of uh, Tink shit. I love Tink. Okay. Tink okay. Dope. Yeah, that's like a name I know. I, that's like one of those names that I, I hear. It, it comes up every now and then. But I feel like she has a lot of great music that a lot of people don't give her, you know, they don't give her flowers for. Yeah, she's sense. definitely underrated, man. Yeah, it's that definitely one of those underrated artists. Um, if now if there was anything that you can change, like possibly with the with the music that's coming out right now, what is something that you feel like a lot of artists are lacking at the moment? Is it the artist development, the writing um, or the production? Um, I think it's all of it, to be honest with you. Okay. I think I think these labels are getting really lazy with artist development. I think that they're getting penny they're penny pinching. They're not they're not investing the money into the proper things to make these artists the way that they should be. You know what I'm saying? Like it's too easy to be it's too easy to make fucking three million on a fucking video in one day, dog, on a on a <laughs> trash ass video. It's right. too easy. There's something wrong. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a little crazy right now. Um, but no, you're definitely right when you say you know everything. That's kind of like what I was thinking. But I know everybody has their own opinions. Um, what what is your opinion on um songwriting? Should artists start to try to write their music, you know, write their own music more, or you know, should they take that state where you know they have a lot of that help? Because I know you as an artist, you know, if you can tap into um, onto like songwriting and explaining the the advantages and the disadvantages of songwriting or not songwriting say that question one more time i'm sorry no you're right you know you're fine i was saying that if you can explain to you know to artists that are listening right now the advantages of songwriting and the disadvantages of not songwriting well i mean it is a disadvantage if you're not songwriting because you're not honing your craft but uh the advantages of songwriting is that you get paid in more ways than one. I mean, you're not just getting paid for your singing, you're getting paid for the fact that, you know, you're on this, you're on this record. You've act, you're actually investing melodically or lyrically one or the other into the records, but it's certainly a disadvantage to yourself as an artist to not be a writer or not attempt to be a writer. What were you heavily like hands-on with every record that you put together that came out? Like, were you heavy with, yes. you know, and everything involved? Okay. And explain that process because a lot of artists are kind of like, I, I feel like they all, like, once again, they see the glitz, they see the glam. So they just think, Oh, I'm gonna go in my bedroom. I'm gonna write this song. You know, there's always a process and I'm not asking you to drop the formula to song yeah, writing yeah. or production, but, um, if you can just kind of explain, you know, how artists can, you know, just kind of how they can put it together to where 
it it kind of gives them that leverage to have a great record. Like what makes a great record? Uh, have a great record or a great album. The, the I think I like, think right now the industry is more singles. So and that's the problem. See, yeah. this is where we make the flip. This is where we need. This is why I refuse. I'm not. I'm. I'm not doing it. My album is not dropping until it is a body of work. I don't care. People can call me old fast. You know, she's going the old. That's okay. You can feel how you want to, but history always repeats itself one way or the other. So yeah. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Big facts. Um, you know, and I, and I know, I think there's a couple of records that I actually found, but you know, they're like, uh, you know, big artists that, you know, I like, but I, I feel like the body of work is just something that's not being appreciated anymore. Like, you know, a bunch of people can come out with a couple of lyrics and, you know, they, they're using the singles now to make albums go platinum. And I think that's kind of like a cheat code. And I hate that. Yep, it sure is. And you know what? And it, it's fucked up because back back in the day, we used to have to do album deals. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And we stuck album deals and stuck stuck in a fucking situation for decades. And now it's a single driven fucking, you know, industry. So these people, I don't know, I guess the old school looks at it and gets mad. This is why the old school looks at it and gets mad because it's like, it should not be this simple for anybody to just jump on and be on. Like, I'm going to use the most irrelevant person, like, in the most, for me, to me, the most, the biggest joke. I'm sorry. Like, all shade, not on purpose, but it's all shade. But that Catch Me Outside girl, that shit was a fucking joke. And that mm-hmm. shit so crazy that it had this girl in videos acting like a thug, acting like she was a fucking gangster that hugged blocks for about seven years straight and fucking jugged out of trap houses and shit. Like, and the bitch ain't never even, ain't never even held a fucking a yammy before. Like, this is the shit that I'm talking about. And then we got these kids that are glorifying this shit and they're like, oh yeah. And it's not even real. It's not authentic. Real it's shit. Not even- it's nothing authentic about it. It's like so easy for something. And that is a prime example. How easy it is for anybody to become someone off of, off of, and we'll take it back to back in the day to my, my, my language when it was a gimmick. Right. Remember that? Remember right. that? It was right. a gimmick. Same shit. Just nowadays, it's not called a gimmick no more. It's actually looked at and perceived as real. Right. Big facts. Now, I feel like I feel like a lot of kids are actually dying younger because of this gimmicky stuff, you know, because nobody takes because you look 27 at 13. I mean, right. is it? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I feel like the kids have to live up to these images of handling firearms that they've never, ever handled before. And they misuse them, you know, whether it's a beef and they feel like they have to, you know, it's a clout chasing world right now. And it sucks, you know, in just my opinion. Um, but I, I that situation in particular because it's it's hard enough to prove who I am as a person authentically and because of my skin color and I see people doing this type of shit and glow we I think we had this conversation in one of my rooms before I don't know if you was in it and I was talking about how you know people that come from the hood they don't they're not glorifying staying it they, they right. want to get the fuck out like yep. they want to get out they don't want to be, you know what I'm saying? They don't want to be like that. They don't want to be fucking strumming it and fucking every day not knowing what the fuck you're going to eat for that day. Like, nobody, you don't know, you don't know that lifestyle. So you emulate in a lifestyle that really is not to be glorified. People are really in this shit, bro. I grew up this way. I don't respect that. I just don't respect it. And it really fucks me up that these people got more followers and loving, loving, supporting fucking fans than. Un, uh, like someone like Tink, you feel what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, big facts. No, yeah, that's a big yeah. fact. Yeah, I, and you know what you explaining that? You know, I want you know for people that haven't seen this side of you because I don't remember seeing a lot of like interviews, you know, with you, you know, and I feel like if we did hear interviews, they never kind of like gave us the opportunity to see this side of you. So when you tell people that you grew up like that. I want you to kind of let people know that are in this room right now that haven't heard, you know, that story. You don't have to give the extended. If you can abbreviate it, please give us that, you know, side of that. Well, the reason why you never really seen a lot of interviews with me 
in them is because the labels would limit me with, with interviews until I was done with media training because I didn't give a fuck what came out of my mouth. And they had a problem with that. I couldn't be myself. You feel what I'm saying? So I was like, well, fuck it. If I can't, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I'm not a good actor. So I can't lie. You know what I mean? So I couldn't do these interviews. I couldn't be myself. I couldn't, I couldn't speak how I spoke. But my life growing up, I come from New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's, it's not, it's not like the slums, but you know what I'm saying? It's the hood. It's, it's a poverty stricken neighborhood. It's very diverse in culture. Um, and, you know, it's rough out here. I grew up with a sing. you know, my mother was a single mother of four and my father was killed when I was nine months. So I never had a dad in my life and my mother never remarried. So I never had like, you know, a male figure around and, you know, just living. Yeah. Anybody that's from the hood knows what it's like to be to living in the hood and be raised that way. So, you know, my mom was crazy. My mother was abusive growing up. I had to deal with a lot of that. That's what, you know, kind of turned me into a really aggressive person when I got a little older. You know, my mom being so abusive towards me, I lashed out the world for that. Um, but yeah, growing up, and I grew up in New Bedford, grew up in the fucking hood. I I ain't have much growing up. I barely, I barely had a mother there, you know, but I got through it, you know. Right, it makes right. you who you I would never take it away. Right. And then, you know, did now, you know, being this aggressive person, you're going through what you go through. Did you like have that opportunity to find love and enjoy it? Um, I found love in my first actual like loving relationship, like physical relationship. Uh, but I loved music. That's all I cared about. I mean, I looked my mom in her face when I went to Florida because she had to go to Florida, down, down to Florida with me to enroll me into school because he hadn't gotten the guardianship papers yet. And I looked her dad in her face and told her, I'm not going back at 14 years old. I, I, I wasn't going back. So music, it's, music was what I loved. I, that's what I loved. That yeah. was my... That was my first love. That was, it still is my, oh, it's my, my true, my, it's my true love. No, I got it. No, I just always like to ask artists that because, you know, um, you know, certain artists to say, you know, I found love and this all has happened and, you know, I hated it. You know, I wish I would have concentrated on my, uh, on my craft and my dream a little bit more, you know, so I always like to ask artists that question, like, you know, if, you know, when, and if you did find love, was it a distraction or did it help you? Did it enhance well, you? I was fortunate enough because I was, my first relationship was with my producer. So gotcha. I, and I was with him for a long time. I was with him for five years. So, you know, our relationship was not just some, you know, in-house shit that just happened. You right. know, we were actually in a relationship. Okay. And it wasn't always great. You know what I'm saying? We had, we were like any other couple. Fight and fucking it go back and forth. It, it got, when it got bad, it got bad. But when it was great, it was fucking heaven. You know, and that's why he said that stupid shit earlier. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Heaven. Yeah. He wrote that song. I ain't write it. He's a liar. Right. So with that relationship now, in those five years, like, was was he responsible for some of the records that we're listening to at this point? Um. Okay. So he's responsible for a lot of the records that um are not out right now. Gotcha. But he's also responsible for records that are out on other artists that were on me first. Gotcha. So. Okay. Honestly, yep. And that's a whole nother conversation to explain how that goes down as far as like, you yeah. know, all that. Um, so uh, you know, what 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 was that process like? You know, you're in a relationship with your producer, you know, you guys are with each other all the time, every day. You know, um, how many songs were you guys recording a day? Oh my God, we we were pumping records, but he, you got to remember he was a super producer at the time. Like mm -hmm. everybody was on him, so we really weren't together every day all the time. Okay, because he had other friends. he had other other artists he was pumping records out on. So, but when when we were locked in, when we would be home. I'd be at his house. Well, I had my own place. I didn't live with him. I had my own shit. But 
I, when I'd be at his house, because that's where the studio was, so we would always be there. And most of the time, we'd be in the studio. Though There was one day I was knocked out in the bedroom, knocked out in the room, conked. I was so fucking tired. He was in the studio for mad long, so I just started watching a movie, and I fell asleep. And he came in, he woke me up. He's like, get up, get up. I was like, I'm tired, I don't want to. He's like, come on, I, did, I just got a record. You got you to gotta get up. So I got up. And I went in the studio and we banged out another record. We banged out two records that night. We did that record and then he started another one. But he woke me up out of my sleep and I walked right into the studio and we ended up doing another record. So we like we were constantly... That's why the catalog that he had to sell, or the masters or whatever that he had to sell, that's why there were so many fucking records that were in there that I was on because we were just doing so we have we've done so many like, he says it's about 300 that I know it's more that's crazy and to think because I know there's a lot of leaks on you know on the internet I know there's some some leaks I'm not gonna say a lot I know there's like uh some leaks and I know that we was just talking about a record that didn't actually make the chronicles um you know we'll talk about that record which one uh what was the name of that record that uh we was just literally talking about i think it was the record uh, whoever um, i believe so it was supposed to be a bonus record but they never uh put it on there we was just looking we were just talking about it it was oh, oh it had to be to, oh maybe you are you talking about the old dirty bastard record no not that one no i didn't even talk about that, that one do yet. you ever gotta yeah. be do you ever then. yeah do you ever yeah that, okay yeah, so who I was explaining to you, you guys, in, um, when I was on uh, yesterday, and I explained to you guys that I was in the studio with uh, an artist that's really well-known now. That's who he was talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember who I was, but that's who he was talking about. And gotcha. that she was, she was on yesterday and said something about me. and was like, yeah, I remember when she was vocal producing me, blah, blah. Right. And explain vocal producing, though, for people who don't know, because I know I'm a person that I've heard about it, but I'm not really hip to it. So I would love for it's you so to explain vocal producing. OK, so uh, producer, you think a producer, you think of beats, right? Yep. It's the same thing, like a producer produces beats and then a vocal producer produces vocals. So I stay outside of the booth. The artist goes in. They sing the song, whatever they get wrong. I correct them on it. I teach them how to do it. Um, and then I basically help build the entire record. So mm. we're done with the hook. We move on. I tell them, okay, we're going to the verse. I want you to start at the top of the verse and sing it, you know, straight through. And then we're going to go back and get another take. And then we'll use that as a skeleton. You know, there's, that's what vocal production is. So gotcha. like you're literally producing vocals. You're just producing the entire, you're basically making the whole record got got you because i know i know on reality tv we used to see uh like making the band you'll see somebody in there behind the boards and i just thought that was just somebody that i thought that was a songwriter i didn't know that was probably Could be the song, because the song a lot of songwriters want to vocal because they want their song to sound a certain way right right have you ever been in that situation where uh you didn't like something that kind of came across your lap and you try to change it up and you had to go back and forth with you know with the person who might have co-written it or helped out with the record on me no okay okay yeah i just like to ask like another question i like to ask um but so when you know when when you and this gentleman was you know in your relationship and he was super producing were you learning and soaking up a lot of the stuff oh. from the artist that he was working with absolutely that's uh, that i i give all the credit to him as to you know how i write uh, i give all my credit to him how i you know stack and i how i you know make a record from the ground up i learned from him i learned from being in the studio with him but not just him obviously cuz when we broke up, <clears throat> I ended up, you know, leaving the company and then signing directly to Warner Brothers. And I started working with other super producers like J.R. Rodham and um, Brian Michael Cox. And, um, oh, my God, I've worked with so many people. Mad Scientist, um, co-stars back in the day. They were huge. It's a lot of big names there. It's a lot yeah, of big names. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of So Shock and Carlin. Um I I I worked with everybody. I was on the phone with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. I was supposed to do mm. 
uh, that fell through somehow, some way. I don't know how, but it ended up falling through. But who was uh who was the f- who was your favorite producer to actually like cut a record with? Um, I mean, I I will say Bo is like like the e- he's the easiest. That's the cheat code. Do. It is the cheat code, but uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, the, I'll say this then. My second favorite to mm-hmm. work with was. Diesel. Say that one more time. Diesel. Oh, I don't Diesel. know if y'all okay. know Diesel. Yep. Uh, yep. But he, he produced Lollipop. He produced right. This Is Officer. He, he produced a lot of shit, but I never been in a session where I learned so much about sound mm. being with him. And I call him, I call him Uncle D, Uncle D's, but he's a. Uh, He's cool though. That's my guy, man. He's 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 just dope. Like we created these records from the ground up. Like I was telling y'all, I was telling you in my other room about uh, writings on the wall. How I created that one, and it was yeah. literally walked in with the sound. You know how we played the sound. I, it's I, that is the best. My my records always come out the best, and it's like that. I can go go in when I can do that from the ground up. It's over. That's crazy. And um, what what's the process like? for TK, you know, it's, it's a day, you know, you got to hit the studio. Like, what's like a normal day? Like, like walk us through your day of how you prep when you get in the studio, you know, and how you go through your process of making a record. Well, I make sure that my record is already written before I go in. That's first and foremost. No gym. fucking much in. <laughs> so that, that's a gym. I make sure that it's written already before I go in. Um, when I go in, I... I start uh, with the hook, get the hook done, knock that out, and then I get my verses done. I cut them real quick, and then and I move on to my backs. I do my backs from top to bottom. I just literally go through the entire song, and I'll pick my spots where I want to put, you know, my pockets where I want to put my backs and stack and shit like that. That's a whole gem, though. I think I think the key thing there was have that song written before you get to the studio, because a lot of artists I know, they like to wait till they get there and don't realize they're wasting so much yeah. money and time. It's not. And if you and if your producer is not willing to send you the fucking track just to write the record, I mean, then you need to move forward. That's not, <laughs> that's not a give and take relationship. You feel what I'm saying? Like, you're not you. And, and if you pay for studio time. Or if you even paying for the track and they didn't send it to you, like you should already have that prior to going to the studio. Facts, big, big facts. And then, you know, I always like to, you know, end my interviews with a positive, positive, positive note. So if there are somebody right now listening and they're down, they're like down to the bottom right now, they don't know what they're going to do today or tomorrow, you know, and, you know, you just kind of walk by them and they say, you know, let me know how you got through and you got to this next point to where you're at now, where you are, you know, just happy with self. How would, what kind of advice would you give them to figure themselves, to learn themselves and, and learn how to love themselves and appreciate life for what it gives? I think it's really important for people to do shadow work. Um, and I'll explain shadow work is like basically working on your samskaras and that's a yogic yogic term for, traumas um a lot of times you know we go through traumas in life and we don't realize that they're really dictating our emotions our everyday movements all of that stuff so i think really looking inwardly into yourself and appreciating appreciating the greatness in you and understanding your flaws so you can fix them you know i think that's that's really the most important thing or I, I do appreciate that. You know, I actually appreciate you giving giving us about, you know, 40 minutes of your time because I know you don't have to do that. But I definitely appreciate, you know, hopping up and opening this room, uh, being the first interview of Digitally Interrupted in Clubhouse. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you actually just set the tone. A lot of- yeah. Yeah. Like I can't, I got to make sure everybody I bring in for an interview on clubhouse, they got to be on a, on ABS. You know what I'm saying? Um, oh. <laughs> um, you know, is, and once again, you know, let people know how they can, you know, connect with you and get in touch with you. For sure. Yes. I'm on Instagram. It's the Tanisha Kelly, T H E E Tanisha Kelly. Um, that's also my Snapchat name. Um, my Twitter name is at Tanisha Kelly. What else is there? Facebook, Tanisha Kelly. Um, but there's a lot of fake pages on there. So you kind of just 
gonna have to sift to see which one's the real one because like i said with that bad shit that i'm going through kind of mm. hard yeah i mean you know like you said yesterday though you don't need no badge to verify who you are though you know what i mean it's, it's, i don't need no verification right. but i just know people get confused sometimes when right. they don't see it but it's all about the brand as well no like you said too check out my tiktok Oh, oh, you on the TikTok? All right, hey, all right. I'm gonna I'm definitely check you out on there. Um, can I open the floor? Would are you open to having some a little bit of Q and A? Yeah, let's get it. All right, all right, hold on one second. I'm gonna raise these hands up. All right, so hands are raised. All right, hold on one second. All right. Oh, we got up. Oh, we got Chris. My boo. Chris, what's up, bro? How you doing? How you doing? What up, TK? Hey, baby. Yo, so I have a question. First of all, this interview was off the chain. Thank you for Appreciate sharing, it. you know, your story. And, you know, thank you for holding this platform. Um, Digital, what's your first name? Eric. Eric, right? Okay. Yes. Yep. So, all right, because I was like, let me just make sure. All right. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you for holding this platform. No, no you problem, know what I'm saying? Man. Because there's a lot of us uh, music lovers out here that that really appreciate um, the real ones to get their flowers. And yes, yes. Um, that was actually kind of based on um, my question with TK. Like, how do you, like, what is the one thing about the music industry right now, more specifically, um, because you are so well known with your song choices, your writing, your vocal production, like just how nitty gritty. And I know I say this all the time, but I really compare you um, in the same vein as like the Brandies and the Mariahs of the world, how in depth they are about their backgrounds, their layering, their stacking. Um, what is it about today's production that you feel is really missing? Because like for me personally, I don't understand why people don't make bridges in songs anymore. Like, I thought that was the climax. I thought that was the biggest part of a song. So to me, it's like, I feel like bridges are missing in songs. But what is it, in your opinion, that is missing the most out of production these days? Um, sonically, passion is missing. Um, Ooh, yeah. Sonically, patience is missing in these records. Mm. Yeah, I just I just feel like people are rushing through things and they once they feel like it's just a sound that fits, they just ride with it. So the path is definitely missing in this game right now. I and that's I, I think that's why a lot of times when I come on and I'm baffled by it, I come on and I sing and people be like, Oh my god, they flip out and I'm like, What? That ain't even like the I didn't even I didn't even try. Mm. It saddens me to to, mm. to know people are not being exposed to real anointing like that. It bothers me. Right. Come on, somebody. Yeah, that's deep. Yeah, that's deep. Hey, Chris, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move you back down to the audience so I can let somebody else come up and ask a question. If you have, you have another question. Awesome. Um, I mean, the only other question that I really was going to ask is, um, uh, I mean, and it's not even a question because, you know, I don't like putting people on the spot <laughs> or whatever. You know but... What? If you feel up to it, sis, because I know how it is. Um, but I remember in the Tiny Chat days, you used to sing Kim Burrell's, um, I Come to You More. Mm -hmm. And I was like, gonna say, you know, if you wanna sing a little diddly just to let people know, like, you know, <laughs> you know, your chops and everything that don't know, like, sis can really sing. Okay. Always with my hands out Instead of giving up myself enough to say Lord, I know that I'm in your perfect will I want to be in your will Realizing as I'm grateful as I've been Forgiving you as we moved our sin And I vow right now To never be the same Instead of me lifting them up, always coming to you more than I give to you. Oh, more. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. You better. 
better. You better. God damn. You better. <laughs> Yo, I think I might have to make her moderate. I might have to go in the audience and be like, hey, sis, you got it. It's your concert. Do your thing. Do your thing. Like, do your thing. To the audience. Lord have mercy. Yeah, I got it. I appreciate it. TK, you know I love you, sis. Chris, I'm about to move you back down, my brother. But I appreciate it, though, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, all right. So now we have Miss L'Oreal. Yes, L'Oreal. Hello, how you doing? Hey, Laurel. I'm good. How are y'all? Great. Welcome to the house. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually really, really new to Clubhouse as of last night, so okay. this is cool. Right, well. <laughs> hey, bomb right behind you. <laughs> hey, um, bomb interview, bomb voice. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm loving this. This is this is the first uh, room that I kind of enjoyed a little bit. So <laughs> you know, we bringing good vibes here. Uh, I love it. Um, so I am actually, well, I'm not, you know, any kind of famous or anything, but I do consider myself a singer, um, and a songwriter. One of the ones that, um, I don't toot my own horn at all, but like, I consider myself to be really good, but one of those people who just kind of struggle with it. And I wanted to point out, it was something that you said, Tanisha, that really stuck with me. It was so dead on. Um, when Chris had asked about, nope, I'm sorry, it was digital. Um, one of the questions that he asked you, I forgot the question, but your answer was saying like, um, talking about like the trauma, like exploring yourself, like make sure that when you go into this, like, you know what, like, you know yourself and you know what you're giving. And that really stood out to me because for me and probably for a lot of others, even artists or not, like with the pandemic that's just happened and with the peak and we lost so many different family members and friends, like that's a trauma enough alone to be dealing with close grief. I left, I lost my mom just in 2019 and then another close family member just a couple months later from the pandemic. So like, it, thank you. And same to anyone else here who has lost people from that. Um, but as a singer, like I was already, I was already kind of struggling because I had a couple babies back to back. Um, and you know, as a woman, Tanisha, I don't, I don't think you have children, but not yet. Our, we are so in tune with our bodies. It could be the slightest, in, the slightest flaw. And like, we, we, it's a big deal to us, you know? So to have babies back to back, like I let a lot of stuff go from our marriage. Like it's just been a lot of changes in my life. And now I'm just now at the point where I'm searching who am I? Because if I ever get the shot, I want to, I want to come in knowing who I'm giving, not being overly confident and saying, Oh, I call the shots. I'm this and that and don't have no clout. You know what I mean? But just, knowing who I am, like, I can't get on the stage and somebody throws me at some, some big spot and then I freeze up because I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I know if I have that confidence, if I really understand me, I know what I have to give. And so now I'm at this point now where I'm, I'm finally, it took me back to my, my traumatic experiences as a child and how they affected me still in my adulthood. And now that I'm seeping through that, now I feel like I'm finally at the point where I can actually start you know, networking and, 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 you know, maybe rebuilding my audience and different things like that. But I guess my question to you was that is like, how, like, what was it like for you to, to search within your trauma, to actually have to go back in your mind to the things that greatly affected you in a, in a bad way, and then take that and flip it? Like, how do you, like, how do you navigate through that? Cause it's, it's hard. Like, of people course, say, take your feelings and, and put it on paper, turn it into a song, right? But like, they tell me that I can't even sing without crying. If I write a song about my mom, how do I get through that song? You know what I'm saying? Well, I can say this. It took me about 10 years to write a song about my brother who was murdered 13 years oh. ago. Um, I'm sorry. So it took me, it's like, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, it took me a long time to write. I mean, there's just certain things that, topics that are too sensitive to touch on. I mean, when I did Misunderstood, I... Um, I guess I, ta I, I tapped in, I tapped in and I, I, I had to give into my vulnerability. Mm. I had to give into that. And, but I did it by myself in a room. I made sure no one was, in I could not, I would never allow myself to be vulnerable in a room full of people. So mm. I, I had D town put me in his, his room and let them stay in Pierre's room where we were cutting vocals. And 
stood in that room and I wrote misunderstood in that room by myself. And when I tell you, I cried. It took me mm. two hours, but I cried through that song. And I told myself, Tanisha, you have to do it because if you don't do this, you're never going to accept what your life has been. And if you don't accept it, you're going to hold on to those same scars forever. So mm. I have to accept it. And I, ha and not only that is, is music is a release. You know? Yes. Mm -hmm. so it's a form of therapy. And it was like, no, what better time to allow myself to be vulnerable and my brothers are in the next room. And if I need to, and I need some comfort, I got them. They're there. I'm in this room. Let me just get it done. So I think it's just about facing, facing the fear of having to open those floodgates. Cause that's in, at the end of the day, that's what we really don't want to feel. That we vulnerability floodgates opening and feel that but you, how do you expect to grow my mother always told me no flowers can grow without water so mm -hmm. how do you expect to grow if you are not crying if you're not going through things that are watering you, you gotta water mm -hmm. you. there you go have me in tears now <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate, I appreciate you, you know, coming up here, asking that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move you back to the audience um, for a okay. second. And I'm going to bring up another person to ask another question. If anybody has a question out there, by all means, uh, you know, let's try to I'm, I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next like five minutes. So I pretty much probably have time for about two or three more questions. If anybody wants to ask, please raise your hand. Going once. Don't be shy. I'm an open book. <laughs> Going twice. All right. So I had. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Somebody said they got something to ask. Hold on one second. Hold up. Let me see. We bring them on in. All right. We got Rashawn. Good. Well, good afternoon. Good What's afternoon. Up? What's up, man? What's going on? <laughs> Everything's good. Everything's good. So, yeah, you know, I know Tanisha for since 08. <laughs> we go way back. She knows yeah. I love her. I love her. <laughs> but I don't want to be a friend right now. I want to be a fan. And I want to ask you as a fan, what is... What is your motivation? What What is that passion that thing you always go to whenever you're writing a song, whenever you're in a booth, whenever you are in whatever mood, whatever that makes you write, what is that one thing that you always go back to? And it's like, okay, this is it. Like what gets me to start writing? Yeah. Oh my God, it could be anything like, as of lately, the last two weeks, see, I, it comes in waves for me. Like when I write, like when I start writing like this, like I've been lately, like I can literally walk by the TV and hear somebody say a slogan or something, right? And it'll go in my head and I'll say, oh, that actually, if I flip that and do this, it sounds like this. Oh, that's a song. I'll run in my room, grab a paper. And again, I've explained this um, to you Eric before uh, on another page, but I have to have a uh, pen to paper when I write because right. it's yep. energy tra transference. So I'm literally r racing for fucking pen and paper and I'll write it on anything and just leave it. I literally have like six papers on the side of me right now from the last two days of getting that. I, I don't know what, I really couldn't tell you what, what like pushes that button but it could be anything. I could hear somebody arguing outside and I'll say to myself, I'm so glad I ain't in that shit. And I'll walk, <laughs> home, and I'll walk in my room, right, right back in my room and I'll be like, oh, that's another song. I'm fucking grateful I got away. I dodged a bullet. I ain't, I, I, you know what I mean? Like anything can spark that, you know? Big facts, big facts. Hey, I appreciate you coming up to asking that question. Um, I got time for one more question. I have one more person raising their hand. Ah, uh, give me one second. Here we go. To come up. I, I know he probably more Let me see where they at. See if they pop up. Yep. So we have uh, Carly. So Carly, thank you for coming to the house. Welcome to the stage. You are on the stage with Tanisha. Um, if you have a question, please, by all means, ask away. Yes, um, I'm not gonna lie to you, Tanisha. I felt 
every single word that you were saying. Like you're talking to somebody who listened to you as a kid and used to like take my lamp of my room and act like I was on a stage singing your song. Like, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> like yeah, we met before and like I think like when we was in Jay's room. But um Yes, I my mom Yeah, like my mom used to tell me, like, girl, shut the hell up. And I'm just like I can so many so many. She like shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm just like, it's like two in the it's like two in the morning. So yeah, I've been looking at you for a long time. Like you're definitely talented. Like you know, far as like riffs and ranges and you know certain notes. I've been looking at you for a long time. Like probably since I was probably like 14, 15. So girl, you got it. And when you were talking about that pen and that paper, I get that. Like it's like nothing else matters around you it's like once you have that vibration in your body it's just like well I need you to call me and do this or can you do this I'm like no look I have to put this note on paper because if I don't I'm gonna freaking forget it like I gotta like it's like your own box you know mm -hmm. and, and I'm very much like like when I got to a certain age I had to tap my own self into the music industry and one thing I definitely understood about the music industry you have to keep your freaking box like certain people around you, they might be like, well, you know, you should do this and you know, you should do that. And I'm just like, no, nigga, like, this is my box. Like, can't nobody break my box. And that's why I like working with my manager because like, you know, when I'm talking to him, it's like, he helps me keep that box. Like I can be focused on something else. And you know, you're a female. So, you know, like, you know, a nigga might call you and say this and say that. And you just say, oh my God, you're so toxic. Like, mm -hmm. like, okay, just say for instance, a guy chilling with me, you know, he'll ask me like, what's your goal? You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, I'll try to beat around the bush. Like, you know, okay, I can go to school. I can do this. You know, I spent three years in school. You know what I'm saying? But my, I, I tell people straight up, like, I want to sing. Oh, that's what you want to do? Yes. Like, I'm not going to beat around the bush. God bless me with the talent. And if I don't use it or tell people this is what I want to do, he's going to take it away from me. So well, it's like, well, if you don't use it, he's going to take it away from you. Correct. <laughs> What's the point in him giving it to you if you're not going to use it? Correct. This Big is true. Facts. Big facts. Carly, I mean, did you you want to ask us something? By all means, ask but away. I, yeah, yeah. Like, I want to ask you, like, um, what's, what's a question I probably always wanted to ask this girl? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I know it's in my mind is clouded, but what... What is the main advice to any singer that you ever talk to that's upcoming? What's the main advice that you can just give one person right now? Oh God, I can't give you just one. There's so many, but <laughs> <laughs> just stay true to your craft, man. Don't let people hype you up. There's a lot of motherfuckers out here that'll suck you in and make you think there's somebody they not. Um, I've never been in that position. I, it was the opposite for me. I put people in positions and they just, just drove my boat into a fucking iceberg. So, you know, just don't give anybody that power over you. Just keep honing your craft and never give your power away. And I mean, literally, do not give no POAs to nobody. True. Big facts. All right, Carly. Word. Um, I thank you for that. Yeah, so I appreciate you coming up here. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna move you back down to the audience real quick, and then I have one more question for you, T. And then this is probably gonna be a funny ass question. So, all right. <laughs> so we have Tanisha Kelly, Tori Kelly, Paula DeAnda. Mm -hmm. Is this a girl group of the 2007s? Uh, I don't know, man. That's those. That's some different genres. I was gonna say, like, could different... could you has ever seen you guys being like a? I mean, I'm just talking from a fan point, a point of view at this point because I feel like you three uh, ladies were. I just feel like y'all never got that appreciation for what you guys brought vocally to the industry, and um, you you y'all were fucking 2007 to 2010 up, you know, so. Could you ever see yeah. have ever seen yourself being in a girl group with them? I'm gonna be honest with you, cause I'm, listen, I'm all tongue tied and everything, cause I <laughs> I don't I'm wrong. No, no, you can't say nothing wrong. It's it's, it's nothing that wrong. But say. I will say this: having experienced a girls group already, I probably would never attempt that. Shit 
<laughs> okay. Oh man, that's a whole nother story though. Like, cause that story you gave us about it, that shit like, was hilarious, you know, man. Honestly, it fucks up relationships. And it just, right. it just, it's too much. I mean, right. I already took you earlier how I smacked my old group member in the face. Right, I was right. wilding. <laughs> I was chasing fucking time out the studio, pool stick right. and shit. I was wilding. I was right, bugging. Right, right. Um, well, what what is like one great thing you could say about each of those artists that you liked as an artist? Like what you thought they brought to the table? What was something that you liked? In the group? No, no, no. As uh, like Paula and uh, Tori, like what did you like about them? That What was something that you liked about oh, them that they brought to the table? For me, it's different with Tori. Like y'all, y'all look at her from a newer perspective. I've known Tori since she was 10 years old. I used mm. to vocal produce her when she was 11. Mm. So- okay. I have a different perspective with Tori. Tori, Tori's always been, you know, one of the coldest. Um, she's just a different, she's a different breed of person. And, you know, I will say that she is not, she will never, ever let the industry get the best of her or the better of her, nor let it change her. That's just who she is. Always has been. Her parents raised her that way. Like when she was in the studio with me, they were on top of like anything that she was exposed to, all that stuff. So, you know, she was she was raised, you know, real, real like under the microscope. So right. she, what she, what she, what she embodies literally is, is just purity. Like she just is. She's she's one of those. She's one of those type of girls. But um, she she has her own her own style. Her own. Even though people say we sound like it's just because we all high pitch. That's all it is. Right, We're right. just high pitch. It's just high pitch. But she is. She's so fucking dope in her own right, bro. Mm-hmm. I like I, she's she's dope on a scale that I would say that she could she could probably she could fuck with me and the big dog. Okay, okay. And um if you if you had to do a versus and you were able to pick the person that you did it with, who would you choose to do a versus with? I mean, I couldn't do a versus. I don't have my, I don't have many singles. With the unreleased music that you may have. Everybody keeps saying that, like, but you wrote this song and you did that song. I don't know. I mean, who who was out around that time? Because I know when I came out, all the little white girls was getting put away. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm trying to remember, like, damn. like the. fact, if you think about it, Mm. shorty, one shorty shorty was shoved. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, right. I'm trying to think, like... Yeah. Damn. I'm trying to think of who was out at that time that you probably could do like a versus with. And I think the only person that stood out like right next to you was Tori, though. In all actuality, though. That's so crazy. Isn't yeah. that crazy? Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I, the girl that I, vocal, I but, used to vocal produce this girl. But look, but look, <laughs> but look what you crazy. did, though. But think about it. You had a inspiration on that. And some, that's why I mean, it's a full circle. No, you know, like I just you, took a little part. <laughs> no, but you know, you know, helping, you know, being around somebody and, and people. And I feel like a lot of people have been around you and they will never say like, oh, I was inspired by Tanisha. But yo, let's be real. You've inspired a lot of new breeds like, that are out here right now. Like, um, like uh, that. Uh, I mean, it's no shade to Shorty, but. I just thought it was a little weird, but that Queen Nigel shit when she um the ex or they were doing the um when you say a word and you gotta come up with a song or whatever. Mm-hmm. Song association bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess the question was love and right. well, something like that. And she was she said, Oh, it's a song uh by Tiny Shakelly called I Wish You Love Me. No, she said I when she went to say the name, she was like, No, not that song. This is not and then she switched the song to like some song. Uh, like it was like, it was like it was a little shade. It was a little shade. That's I, that's how I took it. It's either that or baby, you just couldn't hit the notes and you thought twice. Mm. And you was like, oh, I said the wrong song. I don't know, but right. uh, I don't know. But I just I took it as a, as slight shade. I mean, I I just not that I give a fuck because right. I put pause on bitches. I don't I don't do that back and forth shit. <laughs> <laughs> yo, ruthless, man. But yo, I I definitely I, love your energy, man. I love your energy. <laughs> this is why the industry is like this with me. Like they all know how I am. They all know how I'm coming. They all know. They know. They know Tanisha. They know how yeah, I am. Yeah. They used to 
call me little, little bit when I was younger because they don't want to disrespect me and call me little bitch because mm. I just didn't give a I, I didn't give a fuck and they couldn't, they could not grasp it. They're like, That's this great. little girl's out here by herself. She got no family, <laughs> nobody to protect her. And she's walking the fuck out. I did not care. That's crazy, man. But, you know, like I said, man, I, you know, we, we will do, we will do another interview at some point, man, because like, there's a lot to talk about because I definitely have some topics that I would love your opinions on as well. And maybe you can come up and moderate an interview with me, co-host or something, if you're down for that. For sure. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, once again, guys, you know, appreciate you guys listening, whether you're listening. Yeah. Whether you're listening on the streaming apps, whether you're uh, listening to this on YouTube, you know where to find me at digitally interrupted or Mr. I am digital and Tanisha Kelly, the Tanisha Kelly at on Instagram and Tanisha Kelly on Twitter. So, you know, we'll see you guys again in another room and holla at your boy. Yo. You are now listening Yo. to the number one podcast. You have been digitally interrupted. Mr. I am digital. Oh. digital.